is going on, everyone? This is Dr. Josh Funk, and you are listening to the Strength and Knowledge Podcast. What's up, everybody? This is Dr. Zach Baker on the Strength and Knowledge Podcast uh, with Christian Huckfeld, our sports resident at our Frederick location with Rehab to Perform. Now, every month as part of the sports residency, our residents select a journal article that is consistent with the theme or the topic of the month that we are covering as our educational and classroom time. So this month, uh, we were covering the knee. Uh, So Christian, do you mind just telling us what was the article that you selected uh, for this? Yeah, absolutely. So the article I looked at was titled The Effective Physical Therapy versus arthroscopic partial meniscectomy in people with degenerative meniscus tears. And this study was a five-year follow-up of the ESCAPE randomized clinical trial, which was published a few years ago, and it was the same exact study, but it followed individuals for two years. This study really kind of picked up right there, looked at those results, and then followed those same group of individuals for three more years for five years total. Awesome, and I know... Gosh, at our Frederick location, we have, we've been there for about eight years now, so we have a pretty good following uh, just within the orthopedic community of uh, just the knowledge that we have a large post-op population and the ability to handle a large post-op population. So we consistently get referrals uh, from the local orthopedics and in the surrounding Baltimore and D.C. area. We also get a, just a very large number of uh, direct access patients as well people who have recently undergone knee surgery, people who are considering knee surgery. Um, So I'm glad you picked this article because it's extremely relevant uh, with the patient population that we see. Selfishly, knees are my favorite thing to treat. So uh, this is uh, even of more interest to me. Um, But do you mind going into just a little bit of detail with the article of uh, who was included in the article? What were the patient demographics? What were they looking at there? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really important thing to consider is the inclusion criteria in this study really looked at individuals who were middle-aged. So these people were 45 to 70 years old, and they had a presence of a symptomatic degenerative meniscus tear. So we're not talking about people who are um, a little bit younger or are running and twist their knee and have that acute meniscal tear with that significant swelling. These people who are middle-aged with a degenerative meniscus tear. Uh, This study also excluded individuals with really significant um, mechanical pathology. So if their knee was locking up on them or if it was unable to be moved, uh, they were excluded from this, as well as individuals with cruciate or collateral ligament damage as well. Good. And I think that's uh, the interesting thing when you look at these studies. It can be hard to find a definitive sample size because it's very rare that you get uh, knee injuries that do function in isolation. You also You often get... Uh, the combo of, of ligamentous and meniscal injuries. Uh, you get some meniscal injuries that are traumatic, some that are more repetitive overuse. So uh, it's always interesting when I do see uh, studies on any body part, but especially the knee when they say, oh, this is the, the test that you need to do or the evaluation or the intervention for this type of injury. You really need to make sure you do your due diligence of what are they actually classifying as that injury? Who's included in this because there's always going to be some complicating factors or, or potential comorbidities uh, or just confounding variables that we need to be mindful of with that. Um, now, in this article, what were they utilizing uh, for their methods or what were they tracking? What were they monitoring? What were they really hoping to, to learn from this? Yeah, so they were really looking. I mean, the primary outcome was patient-reported knee function. So they used the IKDC through that. And they looked at that at three months, six months, a year, two years, and five years. And they also tracked um, both symptomatic and radiographic progression of knee osteoarthritis as well. Perfect. And did they find anything relevant or were the, uh, were the results, was it what you expected? Was it a little bit of a surprise to you? What, what was actually found within this? Yeah, absolutely. So these individuals were randomized. Once they had the symptomatic uh, con- confirmation of the knee meniscus tear, they were randomized to one of two groups. First group got arthroscopic partial meniscectomy surgery pretty much right away. Um, This group, basically all they had is written post-op instructions and said, go have fun for eight weeks. If you still have issues in eight weeks, come back and see us. 
The second group was randomized to physical therapy, which consisted of 16 sessions over eight weeks, so two sessions a week uh, for about 30 minutes in duration. There wasn't a whole lot of information about what they did in physical therapy. I know it mentioned a little bit about lower extremity strengthening and balance, but there wasn't a whole lot of detail specifically on um, what interventions were chosen. Um, But the results were actually pretty interesting. They classified the groups into, they kind of analyzed the results into two different ways, both an intention to treat and as treated. So the intention to treat really looked at the two groups. One, the people who were randomized to therapy and stuck with therapy, and two, the individuals who were randomized to surgery and got that surgery. And they found from baseline to five years, the surgery group did a little bit better in that patient-reported knee function in the IKDC over pretty much every time point. So the three months, six months, one-year, two-year, and five-year time point. However, it was not clinically significant because it was lower than the MCID for the IKDC, and it was also not statistically significant because the p-value was less than 0.05. So basically, those two groups really showed that surgery did a little bit better, but it was not statistically or clinically significant. And was that, that was better in the sense of patient-reported outcomes, correct? Yes, exactly. There was no objective um, things that you could have measured in therapy per se besides that patient-reported outcome. Yep. Okay. And I think that's important to note, and that's not to say that we're maximizing placebo effect or we're influencing intentions. I think just a very important thing to to appreciate is the patient themselves, and what are they looking for? What are they hoping to accomplish? Um, and when we are providing, we'll go into this a little bit later, but making sure that when somebody comes in and they're, they're contemplating, do I get surgery? Do I not get surgery? Uh, I think just being very transparent and upfront with them in regards to uh, what are the, the prognostics, uh, given their personal situation of Do they right off the bat present as an individual who may do better with surgery, or do they have characteristics of somebody who could be treated conservatively um, and have successful outcomes? But then you also need to poke and prod a little bit in regards to what are their intentions? What do they want to do? What have they been uh, told so far? Are they an open book where they have not seen anybody and you're the only clinician or the only practitioner they've seen? Or are you potentially the third or fourth medical professional they've seen? Uh, Have they had five family members who have had the surgery that did or did not have success with it? So I I think those the interactions with the patient, especially early on, um, if you're coming across somebody who's entertaining the thought of getting surgery and they want your input, um, I think the first and the best thing you can do is just ask, what are their thoughts? Um, What do you know about the procedure? Uh, What's been communicated to you in regards to success rate and potential outcomes? Um, And I think just getting a good idea of where they are at just from a mental standpoint, it can give you a good idea of, is this somebody that we are going to have a breakthrough with conservative care? Is it going to be somebody that uh, maybe we need to provide additional educational or resources for them? Uh, But I think that's very uh, interesting to see when we were uh, defining was something better or worse, and it's exclusively off of Uh, potentially subjective reports, for better or worse, but just something that needs to be acknowledged. Yeah, absolutely. And I think kind of going off of that, the second part of the results looked at an as-treated analysis. So instead of those two groups, it actually opened it up to three groups, the first being the group who was randomized to surgery and got surgery. The second was the group who was randomized to physical therapy and did great there. And the third group was the individuals who were randomized to therapy, were unhappy after eight weeks, and went on to get surgery at that point. So when comparing the three groups, like we had said in the previous results, the group who was randomized to surgery did a little bit better at every time point than the ones who did therapy. But actually, the individuals who did therapy did better than the ones who did delayed surgery. So therapy, if they stuck with it, actually did a little bit better. One thing that you had kind of mentioned Um, there in terms of evaluating every patient differently and seeing what they've tried before and seeing their thoughts and opinions. This study found that, unfortunately, a third of the individuals who were randomized to therapy ended up going on to get that surgery, which I thought was a pretty significant percentage. But exactly like you said there, I mean, I think that's huge in that if somebody's come in and they haven't tried anything, I mean, our bandwidth of ability to try a couple different things with a positive prognosis, I think is probably pretty good versus if they've come in and through the subjective you're hearing, I've tried this for 
eight weeks. I've done a really good standardized strength and conditioning program. I've done a walking program. I've tried a lot of different things, and I haven't had success with any of those. That might be a situation where you're like, mm, I'm not sure how much more we're going to be able to get out of the patient at this point. Yeah, and I think that that kind of brings us into now, like, all right, we have this we have this nice study that was done. We have some results from it. Now, what do we do with this information? I think it, we've kind of started this conversation already, but it, but it's a good segue for a continuation of the conversation. Where uh, something that always comes to mind with me and and how I will use this clinically is we need to keep in mind what is the sense of urgency that we're dealing with with this patient, and does this person have a minimally uh, a, a relatively minimal symptom profile, or is it an elevated symptom profile? Um, do they have something in the near or short-term future that they have to be ready for? Maybe it's an adult who has a out-of-country vacation planned, and they're going to be traveling to Europe, and they're going to be walking around for three weeks, and they want to be able to enjoy it, and that trip is in three months. Well, we have to think best and worst-case scenario, Uh, If we already know that they are a surgical candidate and they are open to getting surgery, it may be best just to move forward with that, and then you still have time on the back end to rehab and prep for the vacation. Uh, Whereas the worst-case scenario of them attempting PT, and maybe they do six or eight weeks of PT, it's unsuccessful. Now they're either going on that vacation and their knee still hurts, or they're getting the surgery and they may not be ready to go on to that vacation. So Um, I I think you can look at it from uh, just your general population, from your athletic population. Is this in the off-season? Is this in the in-season? When we're talking about just not only this procedure but various procedures, what type of time frame are we working with? How much wiggle room do we have uh, from an aggressive or conservative approach? And I always like to think, given our two options that we have, the most aggressive or the most conservative, if the worst possible scenario were to play out, which one would they be more comfortable with? And I think that's a very good starting point uh, for that. Um, Christian, any big kind of takeaways from this? Or I know you're about, you know, what, gosh, four months into to clinical practice now and with the residency. Um, are, are there any kind of aha moments or things that now you've gotten to interact with some patients that maybe in PT school it didn't really hit home with you, but now you, you, you've probably had some successes, you've had some learning experiences, What are you going to utilize from this article? Yeah, absolutely. I think you kind of hit the nail on the head earlier when you were saying it's really kind of, it's it's got to be patient-centered care, and it's got to be dependent on every patient's individual situation, what they've tried, what's worked, what hasn't worked, how long they've tried it. So really in that subjective interview, okay, so we, we know they have a little bit of a meniscus tear. Okay, we're fine with that, but... What, what have you tried? And not just, oh, I've tried PT. What did PT consist of? How long did you try it? What were your exercises that you were doing? How long were you doing it? Did it make you feel better? Did it make you feel worse? Same thing if they had been to any other medical professional. Same thing if they just looked up a bunch of things on YouTube and were doing their exercises at home. Really getting an idea of what they've tried and what worked and what hasn't worked. Because if they've come in and they've tried physical therapy before, maybe from a different clinic, which just consisted of walking and some lower level table exercises, I'm going to be doing that patient a disservice if I put them right back on the table and start doing the exact same things they've already done because they haven't had success with it and they're coming to us for a reason. Okay, so I know that. How can I provide them with maybe a different stimulus, which may help to move the trajectory of their case forward? It's also being honest at the same time. So if they have come in and they've tried a number of different things, being honest and say, this is my thoughts, this is where I think I can intervene, but there may be some limitations as X, Y, and Z if it's been a certain amount of time or if you haven't seen success with other parts as well. And not just kind of giving that blanketed approach to every patient, but really kind of thinking and looking into every individual person as their own unique situation and standardizing from there. And I, I'm glad that you touched on that, just being mindful of previous experiences, because when you have an evaluation with an individual, I'm always thinking in the back of my head, what's our ceiling for potential and how far can we really push the needle on this? And for some individuals, they may have exhausted a lot of the things that you're going to try with them and your ability to drive further change may be relatively limited. Uh, for others, you may be the first person they've seen, and there's just some extremely uh, low-hanging fruit and low-barrier-to-entry activities 
uh, that could be very low risk, high reward for that individual. So I think something that is important to note is when you have individuals that you're not really sure if they are going to have successful with conservative treatment, but you do still think it is beneficial, is communicating to them what are our exit strategies and what are our checkpoints in the future that, hey, this is where we're at today from evaluation. This is what you've identified as a quality of life that you would like to achieve. These are different uh, just daily or performance metrics that you would like to hit to be able to return to activity, return to work, return to daily life, uh, happy and in a very optimal fashion. How are we going to know if we're progressing towards that? And what's going to be our cutoff where we say, hey, we're not going that route anymore. And once we hit that, this is who you need to get in contact with, or this is when you should schedule surgery. Um, And I think patients are extremely appreciative of if they can see the end in sight and they know what they're progressing towards, I've had individuals and whether it's, you know, whether it's a meniscus injury, whether it's a rotator cuff tear, it's kind of those coin flip injuries where, hey, I think we're going to have success, but if we don't, this is what your next step is going to be. And guess what? Worst case scenario, if you do end up getting surgery, you're going to go into that surgery a little bit more mobile, a little bit stronger, hopefully with an even further reduced symptom profile. And I will also leverage that time to teach them and educate them, hey, in the event you get surgery, these are going to be some things that we're introducing now that you're going to get exposed to after. So we at least know now this is your baseline for performance. This is your baseline for tolerance. There's a general understanding of how that activity and that exercise should look and should feel. So if they do end up getting surgery and they come out and you're giving them a mobility or a strength drill, you can better tease out what's just post-surgical discomfort versus the exercise being inappropriate for them or the exercise being performed inappropriate. So uh, I I think forecasting for the patient early on is a very important thing to do as well. So uh, Christian, appreciate you uh, sharing the information with us today. Uh, As always, I enjoy uh, learning this new information without having to go through the hassle of reading the articles um, and dedicating the time that you and Bami Uh, have been doing for us. So uh, appreciate having you on today. Look forward to seeing uh, what you got in store for us next month. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Strength and Knowledge Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode or have been tuned in for multiple episodes, we would love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Until next time, thanks for listening.